All right, welcome back. Um, so on Friday, we did a bunch of, of joints, well, a bunch, we did four, right? So we did um, the sternoclavicular joint, the AC joint, the glenohumeral joint, and we talked about the scapula thoracic articulation, and that's where we left off. So today, we're gonna talk about the muscles that move the scapulothoracic articulation. So we're gonna talk primarily about scapular muscles, and then if we have time, we'll get into a few of the glenohumeral muscles. So one last thing before we move on from the scapulothoracic articulation. So I've, I've alluded to this stuff and I've mentioned it uh, in class before, and I'm gonna try to stay close to the desk because the sound quality was bad on Friday, so I'm gonna try to stay close to the transmitter. Um, so um, I've alluded to this stuff before, but remember that if we start in anatomical position, right? so in this position with your palms facing forward, down here, when I'm moving my arm at my side, I don't have to move the scapula. But I've said a few times that when you move or when you abduct your scapula past 30 degrees, which is the picture that you can see here at B, anything past 30 degrees, now we're gonna have to start to get some scapular motion. So in that thing, in that range between 30 and 90 degrees, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between glenohumeral abduction, so I'm moving my actual shoulder joint, so for every one degree I abduct my shoulder, we have to get one degree of upward rotation of the scapula. So one to one ratio between 30 and 90 degrees of abduction. And then your scapula is almost, but not quite topped out when you get out here to about 90 degrees of abduction. So then after that, for every um, two degrees of abduction, you get one additional degree of upward rotation of the scapula. So past 90, the arm is gonna move a lot more than the scapula does, because again, that upward rotation is kind of topped out. So why is that upward rotation particularly important? And I've mentioned it a couple times. Anybody remember? I'll be impressed, it is a hard question, but anybody remember why? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're trying to do is to maintain the subacromial space. So sub obviously means below acromial, below the acromion. So the subacromial space then is this space underneath the acromion. And what sits in there, remember, is your supraspinatus muscle that you alluded to, also the long head of biceps, and also um, the subacromial bursa. So it's a little fluid-filled sac that helps lubricate. So if we don't maintain that space, the humerus is going to close down on that space, and potentially it'll actually bump up against the acromion, pinching all three of those structures. And so then that causes pain and dysfunction in the shoulder. So obviously that's bad. So the term for that is scapulohumeral rhythm, that the scapula and the humerus have to move together. And if they don't, that's when we get pain and dysfunction. All right, so let's talk muscles. So this, all this stuff is from the lab two sheet. So if you happen to have your lab two sheet, you could fill it out. Or if you have the slideshow printout, that works too. Um, so remember in terms of questions I like to ask, um, I'll ask you about the origin or the insertion of a muscle. So it um, could be in different formats. Like when we get to the quiz, uh, there may be a question that says, this muscle originates here, um, originates on the anterior surfaces of ribs three through five, inserts at the coracoid process. These are its actions, which muscle is it? So that's one of the ways that I'll ask that. Another way that I'll ask that question is to have um, those hot spot kind of questions. So rather than um, asking you where the coracoid process is, I'd ask you to identify the insertion of the pectoralis minor muscle on a picture of the scapula. And so then you'd have to click on the coracoid process. So that's kind of the way the origin insertion stuff works. A few other things. Uh, there's two other terms to know that are not on the slideshow, sorry. Um, agonist and antagonist. So agonist, A-G-O-N-I-S-T, agonist. So an agonist is a muscle that's a prime mover. So in this case, we're talking about pectoralis minor. So one of its actions is protraction at the scapulothoracic articulation. So it is an agonist for protraction. That's what it does, right? So if I ask you, which of these muscles is an agonist for? I mean, which muscle is a prime mover in? What's it do? So agonist is pretty straightforward. Antagonist, less so. So remember that, thinking back to your literature classes, the antagonist is the bad guy. So in the case of muscles, antagonists do the opposite of. 
So if we're talking about scapular protraction, which is sliding your scapulas forward, that bad posture that I've alluded to, what is the opposite motion of protraction? Good, retraction, all right. So that's the antagonistic motion. So if I ask you which of these muscles is an antagonist for protraction, what I'm asking you in a roundabout way is which muscle does the opposite of protraction. So which muscle is a retractor then, okay? And I'll talk about that more as we go along, but just be aware that one of the ways I'm gonna ask the questions is about agonist antagonist. So agonist prime mover, antagonist, it's the opposite. All right, so let's talk about pec minor. So pectoralis minor, you can see the origin there. So it's on the anterior surfaces of ribs three through five. And I've actually got pec major pictured right now. So the reason pec major is up there is because pec minor is deep to pec major. So if I click over one, now I've pulled off pec major and there you can see the actual picture of pec minor. So it originates on the anterior surfaces of ribs three through five, deep to pec major. It inserts on the coracoid process. So basically in you, it kind of sits like this on your chest wall. So I, where I've got my hand kind of in the middle of my pec and then I'm touching my coracoid process with my middle finger. So that's about where it sits. You can palpate it, kind of. Uh, in order to do that, you have to like reach up under pec minor. It's pretty uncomfortable, but you can sort of touch it. So it's up under there. So if a muscle that runs from ribs three through five and inserts on the coracoid process shortens, what's it gonna do? Well, it's gonna cause scapular protraction. So it's gonna pull your scapula forward. It's also going to depress the scapula. It's gonna pull it down. And then it's gonna be a downward rotator. So before I forget, one of the ways I like to ask these questions too, or one of the things I want you to know is at what joint that action occurs. So where, for all these next set of muscles, all of these are scapulothoracic muscles. They're all gonna move the scapula. And when they move the scapula, of course they have to move the SC joint and the AC joint, but I want you to know that they're moving the scapula, so they are scapulothoracic or ST muscles. All right, because then the other set will be GH muscles. So things to know about pectoralis minor, um, it's a muscle that tends to cause shoulder problems um, because most of us tend to kind of sit protracted and with our shoulders depressed for a lot of the day. I know I do when I'm in front of the computer, right? And so one of the things to know about muscles is that if they are chronically shortened, they can lose sarcomeres. When we get to the next chapter, chapter nine, we'll talk about the structure of muscles, but basically they're these, they are these repeating series of contractile proteins called sarcomeres. And so if a muscle is short all the time, the body wants to use as little energy as possible all the time. And so it's like, well, if um, we don't need all those sarcomeres, we'll just get rid of them. And so then the muscle gets structurally shorter, which isn't a big deal when you're sitting like this. But if you're like, you know what, I'm going to go play softball this weekend, or I'm going to go play volleyball or something like that. Well, now I'm going to have to rotate my scapula up to get normal arm motion, but I can't because that muscle is structurally shorter. So then that becomes problematic. We got to stretch that muscle back out. So with, um, long duration shortening, you can lose length of a muscle. Conversely, with long duration stretching, you can actually gain length in a muscle. So if you sit like this all the time, you're gonna lengthen out the muscles on the upper back, so the rhomboids and part of traps. And so then now those muscles get larger, they add sarcomeres. So your muscles are, are dynamic, they're changing, they're adapting. So because of that postural issue, pec minor tends to be one that's, that's short. All right. Serratus anterior. So serratus anterior originates from ribs one through nine. Um, and it's going to insert, this is a really complicated way of saying it here. So the medial margin of the costal surface of the scapula. So what's that mean? I'll show you a picture of that here in a second. Remember that costal means rib, so that'll help you. So it's the costal surface of the scapula. It's the part of the scapula that faces your ribs. And so remember when we talked about the scapular thoracic articulation, that I said that it's an articulation in most textbooks, not a true joint because there's no bone to bone connection there, right? And so the reason there's no bone to bone connection is that there's two muscles that sit between the uh, scapula and the rib cage. And so one of those muscles is subscapularis and the other one is this one, which is serratus anterior. And so you can see serratus here, it's highlighted in red. Um, I'm gonna show you. So again, this is that netter thing that's up in canvas. Um, the reds are the origins, the blues are the insertions. So if we're talking about that costal surface of the medial margin, let me get a, my little hand. There we go. So it's a little more obvious where I'm touching. So again, that, that rib facing surface of the medial border. So all of this blue 
is the insertion of the serratus anterior muscle. So that's it there. And then while I'm at it, this blue over here on the coracoid, that's the insertion of pec minor. All right, so serratus anterior then runs from the ribs to the medial border, if you will, of the scapula. So it's gonna be a protractor and an upward rotator. So serratus anterior is gonna be actually a really important upward rotator. The only time you might have noticed you have a serratus anterior would be if you do a lot of like push-ups or, or uh, bench press or those kinds of things and you're like oddly sore along your ribs. Everybody, anybody ever done that one? Is that, that's a me thing? Okay, no, no, good. At least you're nodding at me, get some confirmation. Yeah, so that's your serratus anterior. You are were, you were probably protracting a little bit, especially on push-ups, like at the very top, you tend to kind of round a little bit. That's your serratus that you're engaging in, so that's why you're sore there. All right, subclavius. So the name tells you where it is. So sub is below, clavius is the clavicle. So you can see it originates on the costal cartilage of the first rib. Remember that the costal cartilage is that uh, cartilage, that hyaline cartilage that sits between the end of the rib, the actual bone, and connects it to the sternum. So it originates from that costal cartilage of the first rib, and then inserts there on the inferior aspect of the clavicle. So it's not a, not a super important little muscle, um, but it does play a role in protraction of the, the scapula by moving the clavicle, and also depression. So one of the things that subclavius does is it helps stabilize the sternoclavicular joint, and uh, in addition to that, it's gonna allow for that normal sternoclavicular joint movement. So whenever we go to protract, so we're, we're gonna have to pull the scapula forward, but we also have to pull the clavicle forward a little bit, and that's the job of subclavius. So it's gonna, uh, again, stabilize and help move that sternoclavicular joint a little bit. But, um, but let's consider it a scapulothoracic muscle, which you can see at the very top of the slide. These are all scapulothoracic muscles. All right, levator scapulae. So levator scapulae is deep to your traps. So um, that was a question I meant to ask y'all. So would it be helpful if I showed you how to find these things on the anatomy app or now you guys can find them on your own? Any preferences? Okay, sweet, good. That takes up more time, so that's good. All right, so we're gonna spin this guy around for levator. We're gonna add some layers of muscle to him. So, and again, we're gonna go stick with his right side, just to be consistent. And let's see if it'll let me zoom. Hold on, frozen. Anyway, this is Levator, I'm trying to add traps, but it's not letting me. The Anatomy app has frozen now, because of course it did. Anyway, we'll let that work itself out for a second. But if I were able to add traps to the Anatomy app, <laughs> I'd have to take them off in order to see levator. So your traps are your big shoulder muscle up here, right? Um, so levator is deep to those. You can see that it originates from the transverse processes of C1 through C4, and then inserts on that superior angle of the medial border of the scapula. I'll show you what that means here in a second. So there's some terminology on there that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so in terms of transverse processes of C1 through C4, your vertebral column, your spine, is divided into three sections. There's the cervical section, which is your neck. There's the thoracic section, which is uh, the, the spine bones that articulate with the rib cage. And then there's the lumbar section, which is your low back. So your spine is cervical section in the neck, thoracic section in the, in the thorax, and then lumbar section in the abdomen. So, the way that vertebrae are discussed then is where they sit within a particular section. So C1 is the most superior, it's the highest up vertebrae in the cervical section. So it's your top vertebrae in your neck. And then you count down one, two, three, four. So C4 is that fourth one down. So it originates from C1 to C4. The transverse processes, I do have some pictures here. So some terminology related to the vertebrae. What you're looking at there is a thoracic vertebrae, so again, in the uh, rib cage section of the spinal column, and that's a posterior view of it. So um, there's a couple sets of processes. So there's transverse and spinous processes. So the spinous process, I'm actually gonna look at a side view. 
the spinous process is this thing right here that pokes out straight toward the back. So in you, those knobs that you can feel along your neck, those are the spinous processes of the vertebrae. And then the other processes are the transverse processes. If I can get my arrow to come back, there we go. So there's a left transverse process and a right transverse process. And then the last one that'll be important for the traps is the nuchal ligament. So your nuchal ligament is one that originates at the base of your skull from the occipital portion of your skull and runs all the way down and inserts on your C7 vertebrae, so the most inferior of your cervical, of your neck vertebrae. And so that ligament, what it does, is it helps you hold your head up without expending as much energy. So if you were to, hold on one sec, uh, if you were to look all the way up at the ceiling and then feel on your neck as you're doing it, you'll be able to feel the little spinous processes. You'll feel some little knobs in there. All right, so stay there. Now look down and see if you can feel those processes. And of course you cannot. And the reason you can't is because as you look down, you stretch out that nuchal ligament. And so now all you're able to touch is that. Okay. And so your traps are going to originate all along that. Yep. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. So this one isn't a muscle, this one's just connective tissue, so it's just collagen. But yeah, you can work your, your spinal extensors like that, yep. Um, so that'll give you some neck stability, works traps some too. So they're not, uh, yeah, neck stuff's important. Um, neck strength is a pretty good predictor of concussion um, susceptibility. So those are important, although with that you also wanna work the front and then the sides of the neck too, but yep. So those are not an entirely dumb exercise. <laughs> But yeah, so you're not actually working the nuchal ligament because again, it's just a ligament, just connecting bones to bones. And so like I said, what it does is as you like look down, you know, so if anybody nods off here in a second, the nuchal ligament's gonna be holding your head up. So you don't have to have muscular contraction doing all of the work. It just helps you uh, minimize energy costs. All right, so then back to levator scap. So again, it originates from the transverse processes, those side processes of C1 through four. And then I mentioned that superior medial border, oops. See if he works. Nope, of course he doesn't. Why would he? All right, um, that's okay. So look at the posterior view of the right shoulder, right scapula. So all of this then, this little blue stripe, that's the insertion of levator scapulae. So again, in terms of landmarks we talked about last time, so remember we talked about the superior angle being here and then the medial border being all of this. And so one of the things I told you was to consider the medial border basically being everything inferior to the spine of the scapula, which is this structure. So all of this then medial border, and then above that we're gonna call that the superior angle. That's where you've got the insertion of levator scapulae. All right. So you can see the actions there, elevation, downward rotation. Those are the two things that it does. So this is one of those muscles that tends to get tight, tends to have knots in it, uh, where people have like neck pain that kind of radiates up, up into their head or out into their shoulder. Oftentimes there are, there are knots, if you will, trigger points in uh, levator scapulae about that. All right, the rhomboids. So there's two rhomboids, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor. Um, major is the large of the two, minor is smaller. And you can see that in, especially in the origin, so with rhomboid major, it spans four vertebrae, right? So it originates from the spinous processes, those things that poke straight out toward the back of T2 through T5. And the insertion is the medial border of the scapula. And you can see they're inferior to the spine of the scapula and it's actually gonna be inferior to the insertion of rhomboid minor. So both rhomboids do the same thing. They both retract the scapulas, they pull them straight back, and then they downward rotate them. So retraction and downward rotation. And as you can see there from the picture, um, the rhomboids are also deep to your traps, so deep to trapezius. So they are kind of palpable in that you can sort of feel them through the traps, but they are a deep muscle. They're underneath another muscle. So that's rhomboid major. Rhomboid minor is the little guy right above it. So you can see there C7 to T1, so it only spans two vertebrae, so it is uh, not as wide of a muscle. The insertion is also along the medial border, superior to rhomboid major. And again, the same three actions. So retraction and downward, sorry, two actions, retraction, downward rotation. 
So the rhomboids are ones that you work. So if somebody had that problem that I mentioned to you earlier, where they kind of sit with their shoulders protracted all the time, one of the things that we'll do to try to fix that is a lot of rowing type motions. We'll have them do a lot of pulling and try to really pinch their shoulder blades together. And some of you that have done rehab exercises have probably done some of that. Um, and so what you're trying to do is strengthen the rhomboids to help reposition the scapulas to slide them back posteriorly or slide them slightly into retraction um, to allow for some more upward rotation. All right. People are still writing. I don't know of any other fun facts about rhomboids. Uh, okay, good. Looks like everybody's pretty much done. All right. This should be our last, yep. Our last of our scapular muscles, your trapezius. So your trapezius, or your traps for short, um, are, it's a pretty, pretty large muscle as you can see, so it originates from the base of the skull, runs all along that nuchal ligament, and then the length of the thoracic spine. So you can see there that it originates from the spinous processes of C7 down to T12. So it runs essentially the upper two thirds or slightly more of your spine. So it covers the entirety of your neck and also of your thoracic spine. And then it inserts all along the spine of the scapula, the acromion, and then the lateral aspect of the clavicle. So pretty big muscle. And because of that broad origin, it's gonna have multiple actions. So some textbooks refer to the traps as having four sections. So I, I like that explanation, so I'm gonna stick with that. So section one of the traps, the way to envision that, those are those most superior fibers that basically run almost straight up and down. So those fibers up here in the neck, so they're gonna run almost straight up and down out here to the clavicle and the acromion. And so those fibers, because of their line of pull, only do elevation of the scapulos, or scapulothoracic articulation. So elevation of the scapulos. They bring them up. So section one's elevation. Section two is these fibers that are more at a 45 degree angle. And so because of that angle of pull, they still do elevation, but now you're gonna get some retraction in there, and then also some upward rotation. So elevation, retraction, upward rotation. Section three are the fibers that run essentially straight horizontal. So your section three fibers are these guys that are basically right in here. So those fibers are only retraction. So they're pretty straightforward. And that's where your rhomboids are gonna sit. They're gonna sit essentially under section three. And then section four, which are these fibers down here so they run at about a 45 degree angle, but downward. So they're gonna do upward rotation, but in conjunction with section two. So where, the, where section two is gonna pull up out here on the acromion, section four is gonna pull down here on that medial aspect of the spine of the scapula. And so the action between those two, pulling up this way and pulling down this way, causes that upward rotation. So two and four have to work together to generate upward rotation of the scapula. Then we got depression and retraction of the other two actions there for section four. So definitely know by the sections, be familiar with that, because that is one of the ways I like to ask about traps. Um, and while I'm thinking about it, so I tried to, I, I remade this slideshow this summer, and I tried to use the terminology that the anatomy app uses, um, but I kind of mashed it together a little bit with the terminology, the terminology that's in the textbook. So if you go to, I think it's chapter nine, go to the muscle chapter, it has origins and insertions for all the muscles. Um, and so those are the ones that I learned initially. The anatomy app, ha app has them a little bit different. And so I tried to use the anatomy app ones because I figured more people would read the app than read the textbook. So um, anyway, that's, I'm trying to be consistent with the terminology. And so the terminology that'll show up in the quiz will be what's on the slideshow. All right, so to break up the monotony a little bit, do a quick case study. So we're gonna pretend that you're a physical therapist and a high school swimmer comes to you and she is complaining of shoulder pain. And since I had several case studies on Friday, that's all I'm gonna tell you for now. So what else do you wanna know about her shoulder pain? 
or about her as an athlete? What kinds of things might I ask her? Yep. Great question. How long have you been hurting? Uh, it's been going on for probably about two months now. What else do we want to know? Yep. Where is the pain? So the pain is primarily underneath the acromion. There is some radiating down the deltoid along the midline here, uh, but primarily it is right underneath the acromion. Yep. That's a very good question. So she does uh, freestyle and backstroke. You want to add any more to that question now that you know those two? That's a really good question, the, uh, and a way to build on that is to say, okay, so if you do the freestyle, does it bother you during that stroke? And the answer is yes. Where in that stroke does it bother you the most? Well, when I really reach up overhead, so I'm in full flexion, and then I go to internally rotate to grab the water, that's when it's the most painful. And same thing in the backstroke, when I reach up overhead in full flexion and really kind of reach back like this, so flexion, internal rotation, that's when it hurts the most. Good question. What else do I want to know about her? Something that I always forget to ask is, is, does it bother you in any of your other activities of daily living? So it's just all the stuff you have to do every day, like brushing your teeth and combing your hair and all that stuff. Um, and so Whirlpool Chain, do you ask that? Great question. And the answer is yes. So it bothers her when she goes to put like dishes into a high cupboard or get them down. Like she has to use her, upper, her other arm to put plates up because it's too heavy on that arm. Um, sometimes brushing her hair. And then also at night, if she sleeps with her arm overhead, she'll wake up in the middle of the night with kind of an aching pain in the shoulder. All right. So any thoughts as to what might be happening here? Yep. Yeah, there we go. Good. Good callback. Yep. So it is, it is primarily a pec minor issue. So she's got that classic subacromial impingement syndrome that I've been talking about. So whenever she's laying there with her arm up overhead at night, she is impinging, she's, the arm is mashing down on the supraspinatus tendon primarily, but again, those other two structures as well. So you can see, again, this is that lateral view of the right shoulder. So there's your acromion, there's that bursa, there's the supraspinatus tendon, and there's biceps. So those are the three structures getting pinched underneath there. What ends up happening with swimmers is actually pretty similar to uh, baseball pitchers. They tend to have additional or uh, more external range of motion than most of the rest of us would have. So they can rotate back this way a little bit more, tend to have a little bit less internal rotation. So because of that, the, the uh, humerus tends to be seated higher up, so more superior and more posteriorly. And then also, especially if they swim a lot of like front crawl kind of stuff or, or freestyle, they tend to be sort of protracted like this. The reason that matters is because then again, if you're protracted, what you also get with that, especially if pec minor is involved, is an anterior tilt of the scapula. So remember, I told you I wouldn't ask you about anterior tilts, but the concept is important for injuries. So if we tilt the, the um, scapula anteriorly, it can't rotate up as much. And remember that upper rotation is going to be what's going to allow us to keep that subacromial space open. So that scapular positioning then becomes problematic. The other thing in swimmers especially is, you know, swimmers do lots and lots of volume. If you're familiar with swim training, they swim six, seven days a week uh, and long time, hours at a time. Um, so one of the things with them is particularly late in those sessions, they'll get some fatigue of serratus anterior as a protractor, right? So then if, if uh, serratus anterior gets worn out and can't really protract anymore, what muscle are they going to recruit that's also a protractor? So other than serratus anterior, what's another protractor? And as a hint, it's the first muscle we talked about. Pec minor, right? Yeah, so if, if you then over recruit pec minor, well, now that's a downward rotator. And so pec minor then, as that protractor, it's important in that role, but it's going to cause downward rotation. So again, that's going to close down that subacromial space. So, so using the, the wrong muscle, if you will, or over recruiting a downward rotator, in this case pec minor, is, uh, can close down that subacromial space and then make you more likely to have shoulder pain. So what we're going to have to do with this athlete is probably a lot of anterior stretching. So you've probably seen athletes doing this in the training room or in the weight room, where you take the foam roller and you lay with it along your spine and you just kind of lay like this and try to let your arms touch the ground, do like five minutes of that. What you're trying to do with that low intensity, long duration stretch is add those sarcomeres back. So you're just doing the opposite of what probably caused the problem in the first place was you sitting like this, you just sit the other way and then try to stretch the muscle back out and hopefully regain some of that length. All right, so that's subacromial impingement. 
one of the more common causes of shoulder pain. All right, more muscles. So all of those muscles were the scapulothoracic muscles. So all the previous muscles moved the scapula. So they all inserted somewhere along the scapula or the clavicle. Now we're switching gears and we're doing glenohumeral muscles. So all of these muscles are going to move your arm. So all these muscles insert somewhere along the humerus. As a hint, if the muscle doesn't insert along the humerus, it can't move the humerus. Because I know, at least initially when we're doing this stuff, that there's some confusion between what's a scapular muscle and what's a glenohumeral muscle. So to make it as clear as I could, if you've got the lab sheet, uh, the front page is the scapular muscles, and the back page is the glenohumeral muscles. So back page moves the arm, front page moves the scapula. All right, so glenohumeral muscles. So the first one there is pectoralis major. And so pec major is, again, probably one you're familiar with from doing push-ups and, and those different kinds of pressing activities. So pec major is the one that's highlighted. It's got two heads. There is a clavicular head, so along the clavicle. And then there's a sternal head. Those two run together. And they insert along the lateral aspect of the intertubercular or bicipital groove. So pec major, then, is primarily a flexor at the shoulder, which you know, because whenever you do push-ups or bench press or any of those pressing kinds of motions, that's glenohumeral flexion. So pec major, primarily a flexor. It's also an adductor, brings your arms down to your side. So if you're doing things like pull-ups or any other kinds of pulling motion with your arm overhead, coming back down to your side, that's adduction. So pec is involved in that, as are your lats and teres major. So we think of lat pulls as primarily a, you know, a lat exercise, which they are, or pull-ups as a lat exercise, which they are. But in addition to that, pecs are also involved in their role in adduction. And finally, pecs are really powerful internal rotators. So they bring your arm toward the midline. So pecs are going to be involved in throwing motion. They're going to bring you from full external rotation. They're going to pull you into internal rotation. So the strength of the pectoralis major muscle, along with a few others, is going to be important for throwing velocity. So one of the things um, I wanted to point out on the netter slide here, so you've got three muscles that we'll talk about that insert along that intertubercular groove. So pec major is the most lateral of them. If you look at the skeletons in the lab, the pec major line is really, really long. It's a lot longer than that, but that's okay. But what I want you to be aware of is it's, it's the more lateral of the three. So you've got pec major there, and then you have latissimus dorsi on that medial aspect of the intertubercular groove and then teres major right here. So all three of those muscles are going to be adductors, internal rotators. So just something to be aware of there with their insertion. All right. Next one. Corcobrachialis. So the name tells you where it runs. So when you think brachial is kind of the upper arm. So corcobrachialis originates from the coracoid process inserts about halfway down the humerus on that medial aspect of it. Um, and so coracobrachialis is a flexor and an adductor of the arm. So it is one, um, it's on the, the plastic arms that you'll see in the lab. It's kind of just behind biceps along the medial aspect of your arm. So that's another one where at times, again, if you've done a lot of like push-ups or, or different pressing exercises, you might have noticed that you have some kind of an odd soreness along the medial aspect of your arm. That's your coracobrachialis, again, from its role as a flexor. So it helps you push. So it assists pec major. Um, if you printed the slideshow, I changed it this morning. Um, yeah, so the, the, other, the old version of the anatomy app had internal rotation on there. And I was looking at it this morning. I was like, man, I have only ever seen internal rotation listed one time. And it's in the old anatomy app. And so I checked the, the updated, the complete anatomy 20, and it doesn't have internal rotation on there anymore. So I took it off, which is good because I think it's wrong. So, so corcobrachialis, only a flexor and adductor. So if you, if you had the internal rotation on there, scratch it off for me. Um, so flexion and adduction for corcobrachialis. Um, and as far as its insertion halfway down the humerus, so this little blue patch right here, that's the insertion of coracobrachialis. And then again, it originates from the coracoid process, so it originates here from this tip right there on the coracoid process. All right. Subscapularis. So subscapularis is one of the four rotator cuff muscles. 
So it originates in the subscapular fossa. So remember we talked about that whole anterior aspect of the scapula, that big red thing on the uh, skeletons in the lab, that all of that's the subscapular fossa. And so subscapularis originates there, inserts on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So it's the only one of the four rotator cuff muscles that inserts somewhere other than the greater. So it's the only one of the four that inserts on the lesser tubercle. And so it is an internal rotator and an extensor. And so by saying it's an extensor, I mean primarily if, if your arm is already in flexion, it'll bring you back into extension. But that's not really its primary role. Its primary role is internal rotation and then stabilizing the glenohumeral joint, which is going to be all of the uh, rotator cuff muscles. They're all going to be glenohumeral sta stabilizers. So biceps brachii, we've talked about a bunch, but I've never actually shown you origin insertion stuff for biceps. So remember that biceps has two heads. So biceps has a long head and a short head, and that's of course what the name means, biceps is two heads. Um, so long head and short head. The short head originates from the coracoid process of the scapula. The long head originates from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. So supraglenoid on top of the glenoid. When we're playing with the scapulas in lab, or if you're playing with the anatomy app, you'll see a little bump on top of the glenoid. That's where biceps originates. So it originates from that supraglenoid tubercle. Both those two heads come together, common belly, and they insert into the tuberosity of the radius. You can see I've got some redundancy on my slideshow. <laughs> Radial tuberosity of the radius. Anyway, I thought it was funny when I was looking over it this morning. I was like, I should change that. Nah. So anyway, uh, tuberosity of the radius, or radial tuberosity either way. So biceps is a pretty active muscle. It's actually a, a muscle that crosses three different joints and causes movement then at all three. So at the glenohumeral joint, so at your shoulder, biceps is a flexor. At the humeral ulnar joint, which is the primary hinge joint of the elbow, biceps is also a flexor. So flexor glenohumeral, which is the shoulder, flexor humeral ulnar, again, hinge joint of the elbow, and then the last joint on there is the radial ulnar. So you, as you know, you can flip your forearm over. It can be in supination with your palms up, or you can flip it with your palms back. That's forearm motion. So that occurs at the radial ulnar joints. You got two of them. There's a distal one down by your wrist, proximal one up by your elbow. And so biceps causes then supination at the radial ulnar joints. So it does a lot of stuff. Uh, a couple things that I should point out. So with biceps, the short head is the more medial of the two. The long head is the more lateral of the two, which I was telling somebody in lab the other day that I, that always confused me in terms of just like looking at myself and being like, okay. So if you look at the way your biceps kind of comes down to a point, the point is located medially on your forearm. So it looks like it's longer on the medial aspect, but that's, that's the short head. And the reason the long head is called the long head is because of that long tendon of origin. So it's the long head because it has a really long tendon that originates up there on the superglenoid tubercle. So anyway, long head lateral, short head medial, both insert the radial tuberosity. Um, the other thing, so since biceps does all that stuff, one of the things you'll see if you want to uh, work on the shape of your biceps, so people will oftentimes talk about doing dumbbell curls where you flex the elbow, but then you also supinate. So the idea there is that you fully flex the muscle, you short, shorten as much as you can. Obviously you could even work some shoulder flexion in there. Um, but so that's why you see people say, oh, you should flip your hand over whenever you do curls because biceps is a supinator. I've also seen people at the gym. <laughs> this is like at a gold's way back when, but I see guys that were like, oh, it's a supinator. So they take the biggest dumbbell they could get, they could get like a 70 and they just sit there and just do this. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? It's not doing anything. <laughs> Maybe go do some pull-ups. Um, so anyway, that's the rationale for doing that. Uh, but because, so one of the other things about biceps, because it crosses three joints, it's more susceptible to injury. So muscles that cross multiple joints, so biarticular or triarticular muscles, so biarticular muscle crosses two joints, triarticular crosses three, which is biceps, um, those muscles are more susceptible to injuries. So biceps is a fairly commonly injured muscle in your throwing athletes. So after they um, you know, your pitchers oftentimes get biceps tendonitis from throwing the ball. Biceps, because it's a flexor, has to contract and then lengthen. So um, it's an, an antagonist for shoulder extension. 
Um, and so it's going to contract and lengthen, so that then does some damage to the long head of biceps. The other thing is in strength sports. So you'll see um, like strongmen when they go and do like the atlas stones or any of those kind of things, they have to like go pick up a big rock and then they got to put it on top of something. So now you're flexing at the elbow, flexing at the shoulder, really exposes biceps. So, so bicep injuries are fairly common in those strength athletes from having to do both of those things at once. Yep. For the strongman, most of the time, it's actually the insertion. And so what, what you'll see is that rather than having that little V-shape where, where biceps inserts, it just goes flat. And so um, I meant to put in a video. I'll, show, I'll have to show you on Friday. But there's, I've got a video of, of this, I think, college kid doing deadlift. And he, like, he goes to deadlift. He starts with his arms, his elbows flexed. And so as he picks it up off the ground, you can see his biceps pop and roll up a little bit. And like he finishes the lift. And then he's like, mm, has this weird, like, something happened face. And he puts it down, and he kind of reaches and grabs his arm. He's like, oh. And when he looks at it, it's pretty funny. I mean, it sucks, but it's funny. Um, so, uh, yeah, so usually it's down there. Um, you can get the, the origin ones. Um, usually that's like a forced extension of the arm. So I knew one of my colleagues at, at um, previous institution was doing some tree trimming. And he, like, trimmed a tree branch wrong. And, like, his arm, he was trying to support it and just, like, forced it down here. And so it pulled the biceps off that way. So the strong men kind of athletes don't typically get up here. They usually get more of the insertion. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so the, yeah. All right. And then let's do one more. Let's do deltoid, and then we'll call it a day. All right. So deltoid. Big muscle, uh, and its, it's interaction with the um, rotator cuff is going to become important here in a second. So uh, deltoid originates all along the acromion, but also along the clavicle and then part of the spine of the scapula. So uh, in the lab, you'll see the, that red line that runs essentially kind of that lateral portion of the, of the spine of the scapula all along the acromion and then that lateral third of the clavicle. All those... It, one of the ways to think about deltoids is, is essentially is having three heads, that there's an anterior head on the front, a lateral head on the side, and then a, a posterior head in the back. So all three of those come together and insert the deltoid tuberosity. So deltoid does pretty much everything at the shoulder other than adduction. So the, the middle head, if you will, or the more lateral of the heads, is an AB ductor. So it reaches out to the side. That anterior aspect of the deltoid is a flexor. So the front part of the deltoid causes you to flex. The posterior part causes you to extend. And then if we contract the fibers back to front, we get internal rotation. If we contract them front to back, then we get external rotation. So deltoid then does, again, abduction, flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation. And in truth, if your arm is all the way overhead and you're pulling it back down, some of the most inferior fibers will be involved in that. Um, but that's only, I'm trying to do most things from anatomical position, so we'll, we'll say it's not an adductor. So it does pretty much everything. And like I said, that'll be important when we talk about the rotator cuff. All right, so that's lots of muscles for today. And I'll, I'll put in some injury videos for next time just to make things more entertaining for all of us. Um, so yeah, any questions or anything? Yep. So the sub scapular, so you're doing like um, table flies or something, would that help your pec major to pull your armor? Yep, it's going to play a role in internal rotation, but it's also actively stabilizing the humeral head. It's keeping it from sliding up. So it's, it's kind of doing both of those things at once. Yeah, good question. Anything else? No? Awesome. All right, so on Wednesday, we'll finish up uh, glenohumeral muscles. And like I said, I'll probably throw some injury scenarios in there. And then we'll work on... Uh, making sure you know agonist-antagonist stuff. So we'll see you on Wednesday.